Welcome to Cinematic Excrement, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Christmas in July! Otherwise known as Sean wants to review a Christmas movie and doesn't want to wait until December to do it. So, like I said at the end of my last video, today we are diving into the twisted little mind of Mr. Kirk Cameron with Saving Christmas. Oh, this gonna be good. Saving Christmas, also known as Kirk Cameron Saving Christmas, was originally released to theaters for a limited two-week engagement in 2014. It stars Kirk Cameron as himself, his sister Bridget as herself, and Darren Doan as Bridget's husband, Christian White. You heard me correct, his name is Christian White. It's not every day you see a movie where the main character's name is also its target audience. Stone also co-wrote and directed the film, poorly in both cases. He previously directed a few movies you've probably never heard of, including two that also starred Kirk Cameron, and earlier in his career he made a few Blink-182 music videos. How he went from Blink-182 to Kirk Cameron, I have no idea. Describing this movie is a little tricky for various reasons. Hell, I almost hesitate to even call it a movie given its sub-80 minute running time, which includes a 10 minute ending credit sequence, and there's really not much of a plot to speak of. In place of a plot, it has a hastily slapped together collection of half-baked ideas. It's kinda like a jigsaw puzzle with several missing pieces. And a brain injury. I didn't get the chance to see the movie during its brief theatrical run because I was busy doing anything else, but now that it's available on DVD, I can finally find out what all the fuss is about. Although I gotta say, I am not at all impressed with the DVD cover. It just looks... boring. And I know what you're thinking, the DVD cover is boring, so what? Well, take a look at the poster that accompanied the movie's theatrical run. Look at that. That is a work of art. Why was this not on the DVD? Well, anyway, the movie opens with Kirk Cameron sitting in what I assume is the director's living room, talking about how much he loves Christmas. And boy, does this man love Christmas. I love the fire. I, I love the presents. I love the stockings. I love the tree. I love the fudge. I love the lights. This goes on for approximately 37 minutes. Or maybe it just felt like it. But have you noticed, there's some people who would love to put a big wet blanket on all of this. Mm, no, not really. They don't want us to love Christmas so much and celebrate it the way we do. And who exactly are they? ISIS? There's this one group over here that says, hey, if you want to sing your songs and do your stuff at Christmas time, that's fine, but tone it down. Don't sing so loud. Keep it in your house. Don't let it spill out into the public and bother the rest of us. Oh, I get it. You're talking about people who don't like it when you try to force your own personal beliefs onto them. Well, suck it up and deal with it, Kirk. Not everyone believes what you believe. And that's okay. Many people in this world aren't Christian. And at this point, even most Christians are sick of your shit. He also talks about a group of people who claim all the things we do to celebrate Christmas don't actually have anything to do with Christmas. He's gonna make some stupid comment about the Druids, isn't he? What are they gonna do next? Tell us hot chocolate's bad for us? The, the, the Druids invented it? Called it! Also, hot chocolate is indeed bad for you if you drink it excessively. Duh. And no, it was not invented by the Druids. It was invented by the Aztecs. I know this because, unlike you, I spent the necessary 10 seconds to look it up on Wikipedia. So what are we supposed to do? I don't know. Make a shitty movie? After an opening credit sequence that features the most confusing depiction of Jesus' birth I've ever seen, we get to the movie proper, which takes place at a Christmas party put on by Christian and Bridget. Hey, everybody. That's me. Yeah, we kind of figured that out based on the fact that we just saw you two minutes ago. Thanks. And here we get a taste of the terrible directing this movie has to offer. I hope someone got a tripod for Christmas. All right, who wants hot chocolate? All right, who wants to teach me how to frame a shot? Our story, or the closest thing this movie has to one, focuses on Mr. <laughs> Christian White. 
I'm sorry, I can't get over how silly that name is. Christian is not happy with the way people are celebrating Christmas, as it seems to him people are putting less focus on the birth of our Lord and Savior and more on presents and pretty decorations. And judging by the look on his face and the unusually ominous music, I kind of expect him to go postal before the movie's over. Commercialism, greed, holiday junk, materialism, paganism, elf worship. Ah uh, yes, Christianity has long been at odds with the cult of Will Ferrell. My man Christian, how you doing? What's up, DeAndre? Oh, I almost forgot about this guy. How could I possibly forget about this guy? Ladies and gentlemen, this is our token black guy for this evening's festivities, DeAndre. Like D and then Andre. And he is the most stereotypical sassy black guy you will ever see outside of a Michael Bay movie. His job in Saving Christmas is apparently to rant about nothing in particular. I don't want floor two. You know what happens down to floor two? I don't. Don't want to find out, because I'm on floor four. And I like it that way. We're going to keep it that way. We're going to march if we have to. Straight power. Mm -hmm. Preach on, girlfriend. You tell him. Wait, did he just say straight power? As if this scene wasn't already ridiculous enough, about halfway through DeAndre's ramblings, his voice suddenly vanishes into the background, and all we can hear is the soundtrack. And unlike Manos' The Hands of Fate, it appears to be intentional. You know you're in trouble when the movie loses interest in its own characters. Eventually, Christian decides he's had enough of this nonsense and retreats to his car, and Kirk decides to join him. And this is most of the movie right here. Just two guys talking in a car. I assure you, it's every bit as exciting as it sounds. Christian tells Kirk how he's fed up with the commercialization of Christmas, though he says this in the most roundabout way possible because they have to pad the movie's running time. He eventually does get to what is admittedly a pretty good point. How many kids could we have fed? How many wells could we have dug? Okay, so maybe we should put less focus on getting cool presents and more on giving stuff to people who actually need it. I can dig it. And at first, it seems like Kirk is on the same page. I hear you. I get it. My man. You're all wrong. Wait, what? Kirk, I'm um, getting some mixed signals here. And from here, Mr. Crocoduck proceeds to explain how Christian's gripes about the way we celebrate Christmas are actually good things. And if that confuses you, don't worry. It'll all make sense never. First, Kirk tells an incredibly long-winded tale recounting both Jesus' birth and death, and how the two are connected because in both instances his body was wrapped in cloth. Swaddling cloth at birth, and burial cloth at death. But the same is probably true of a lot of people who lived in that time period, so I'm not really sure why this means anything. Did you ever wonder why the wise men brought frankincense and myrrh at Jesus' birth? Those were burial spices. Why would they bring burial spices to a baby shower? Well, infant mortality rates were higher back then. Maybe they just wanted to come prepared. Wow, even I thought that was dark. Also, according to the very Bible you claim to have read, the wise men weren't attending a baby shower. They arrived long after Jesus' birth, possibly by as much as two years. I gotta admit, I never saw the whole swaddling cloth thing. Probably because you're not a moron. And how did that in any way address your question about feeding the hungry? Maybe I'm missing something here, but I don't see how that has anything to do with the fucking blanket. Christian also takes issue with how the way we celebrate Christmas has roots in the pagan celebration of the winter solstice. Jesus was not born in December, and we're celebrating his birthday in December. When was he born? Well, according to most biblical scholars, probably sometime in the spring or autumn. The Gospel of Luke specifically mentions shepherds in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night, something that they would not be doing in the winter since it'd be too cold. And I can count on one hand the number of times I attend church every year. How do I know more about what's in the Bible than you do? And then, get this, Kirk tells Christian that Christmas trees do not, in fact, have roots in paganism. They are actually in the Bible, specifically in the book of Genesis. For you see, the lampstand in the tabernacle was designed to resemble an almond tree. And since it was a tree with lights on it, it was really the first Christmas tree. Even coming from a guy who thinks a banana is proof of God's existence, that's a fucking stretch. 
And no, I'm not making that up. This is what Kirk Cameron actually believes. But wait, there's more. Kirk also apparently believes the cross upon which Jesus was crucified is also a Christmas tree, because they hung Jesus on the cross like one would hang fruit on a tree. Well, there's a lovely image. So does that mean instead of brightly colored balls and strings of lights, we should start hanging dead Jewish guys on our Christmas trees? What the hell, Kirk? So when you walk into a Christmas tree lot, I want you to see hundreds of crosses. I want you to see a place where hundreds of people were condemned to a slow and painful death. Merry Christmas! And the early church had plenty of good reasons to celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th, and it had nothing to do with the winter solstice. I don't suppose you're going to list any of those reasons, are you? No? No, we just... I have to take your word for it, huh? All right. By the way, last I checked, it was God who made the winter solstice. Well, that's the fucking cop-out of the century. You could use that to explain literally anything. Sure, this part of the Bible appears to have a contradiction, but that's okay because God invented contradictions. You are an idiot. Ow. Of course, later in the movie, Kirk talks about how we have to, and I quote, infuse old symbols with new meaning, which certainly sounds like he's admitting Christmas did borrow from other traditions. Good grief, man. You can't even keep your story straight for one hour? And what about Santa? How does he fit into all of this? And isn't it wrong to put so much focus on the jolly fat man instead of the man whose birthday we're supposed to be celebrating? S-A-N-T-A. -A. Rearrange letters. Satan. And now they're stealing jokes from Saturday Night Live. Oh, but God invented jokes, so it's all good. The real Santa Claus was a real bad, bad dude. Perhaps, but was he a bad enough dude to rescue the president? And with that, Kirk goes into a story about the original Santa Claus, St. Nicholas of Myra, who looks like he's about to slap a bitch. Now, if I tried to show you how this really happened, You'd see a lot of guys in robes, wearing tall hats, carrying scepters, and swinging incense everywhere. It'd be a mess. I want you to imagine this a little more Lord of the Ringsy. I think the Chronicles of Narnia would be a better comparison, but okay. So many hundreds of years ago at the First Council of Nicaea, there was an argument over the divinity of Jesus. Some guy named Arius thought Jesus did not have the same divinity as God, whereas Nicholas believed the two were co-eternal and on equal footing. Nicholas had heard enough of Arius' babbling. No, I won't say it. It's too easy. According to legend, Nicholas became so angry with Arius' blasphemy that he struck him in the face. So I was right, he was about to slap a bitch. Seems like kind of a dick move to resort to violence just because someone doesn't believe what you believe. But I guess it's okay because God invented violent outbursts. The guy you think is distracting everyone's attention from the birth of the Christ child is actually the defender of the faith you want to be. No. No, he's not. No one should want to be like that. By the way, if this story has somehow soured your opinion of St. Nicholas, you can rest assured it's almost certainly bullshit. We don't even know for certain if Nicholas of Myra was at the Council of Nicaea in the first place, and contrary to what Kirk says in the movie, Arius was a priest, not a bishop. So he wouldn't have been allowed to speak at the council in the first place. But hey, why let facts get in the way of a good story? Santa... ...is the man. In Rise of the Guardians, yes. But in your movie, he's an asshole. And that's pretty much the entire story. Christian complains about the way his family celebrates Christmas, Kirk tells him some bullshit stories that don't really address any of his concerns, and somehow this completely changes Christian's outlook and he rejoins the party by... sliding headfirst into the presents? You okay? Of course he's not okay. He's been trapped in a car with Kirk Cameron for an hour. Why would he be okay? And then the hip-hop dance party breaks out. That's not a joke. Ladies and gentlemen, the big-lipped alligator moment of saving Christmas. Right the fuck out of nowhere, everyone starts dancing to some version of Angels We Have Heard on High that sounds like it was performed by an auto-tuned knockoff of One Direction. This goes on for a good five minutes, and it is absolutely breathtaking. 
both because of the awful editing and the badly choreographed dancing. And of course, the black guy is the DJ. Personally, I like to think this happens at the Cameron household all the time. Not just at Christmas, mind you. I mean, at random moments throughout the year, everyone is suddenly compelled to start dancing. And just when you thought it was all over, Kirk drops one last bombshell on you. And don't buy into the complaint about materialism during Christmas. What? Pull out your best dishes, your finest linens, the biggest ham, every side dish you can possibly imagine, and the richest butter. Is he seriously arguing that materialism and gluttony at Christmas are good? I mean, I'm sure the retail and food industries appreciate the sentiment, but from a Christian perspective, that's about the most ass-backwards thing ever. But I guess I shouldn't be surprised. This is coming from the same guy who thinks Star Wars has a hidden Buddhist agenda. What the hell are you putting in that hot chocolate, Kirk? So that's Kirk Cameron saving Christmas. Wow. I heard rumors, I read reviews, I knew it won four Razzies, including Worst Picture, but I still was not prepared for this. Everything about this is wrong. The acting is wrong, the directing is wrong, the editing is wrong, the message is wrong, sweet Jesus, the message is wrong. And the few people who saw this movie responded exactly like you think. It currently has a 0% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and occupies the number two spot on IMDb's bottom 100 with a rating of 1.5. And to give you an idea of just how bad your movie has to be to get that low of a rating on IMDb, The Last Airbender has a 4.2. But there are a few people who liked it, according to the DVD case. This movie has been described as a wonderful defense of Christmas traditions by Dr. Ben Carson. And yes, that would be the former presidential candidate who, I remind you, thought the pyramids were used to store grain. And Phil Robertson of Duck Dynasty fame said, It will change the way you think. Well, he's not wrong. I used to think Kirk Cameron was stupid. Now I think he's batshit insane! Being the delusional egomaniac that he is, Cameron assumed the bad reviews from critics were some sort of slam campaign from... I don't know, the druids, I guess. And he asked his Facebook followers to go to Rotten Tomatoes and tell the critics to suck it by boosting the audience score. At the time, according to a snapshot from archive.org, the audience score was 50%, and Kirk himself claims it got as high as 94. Today, it's 30. <laughs> Well, Cameron and his supporters can try to prop Saving Christmas up all they want and blame whoever is a convenient target for the bad reviews. The fact is, it's a shoddily produced movie that does nothing but preach to the choir. And that wouldn't be so bad if it at least preached something good, but they couldn't even get that right! And with that, you'd probably expect me to tell you to avoid this movie at all costs. Well, here's the thing. Yes, it's terrible. Absolutely. But it's that special kind of terrible, like The Room or Birdemic, that really has to be seen to be believed. I know it won't appeal to everyone. Some will find it boring, some will find it infuriating, some will find it insulting to everything they stand for. But if you're in the right mindset, there is something truly hilarious about just how inept this movie is. So if you think you can handle it, I actually recommend giving this one a watch. It won't take much more than an hour of your time, and you just might get a few laughs during the holiday season. If nothing else, it certainly gives new meaning to the term White Christmas. Next time, we are going to journey to the wonderful world of superheroes with something exciting, something amazing, something... fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Okay, good. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and don't listen to Kirk Cameron. Ever. I like fat geese. I <laughs>